Okay, this Cuban Missile Crisis is going to get kind of interesting here. And we're going to see if that leak that the Kennedy brothers slipped out to Walter Littman does any good here. But we'll talk about again Friday, October 26th. At this time, President Kennedy in the morning received a call from Secretary of State McNamara at the Pentagon. And McNamara informed the President that the Navy had lost the location of a Soviet tanker called the Grozny. Uh, McNamara, McNamara further informed Kennedy that the ship had crossed the quarantine line, which really annoyed the president, and he told McNamara to keep him posted. Finally, they got the Grozny signaled, and Admiral Anderson contacted the Pierce and ordered them to follow the rules of engagement because they had crossed the quarantine line. And as a result, Admiral Anderson, in front of Secretary of State McNamara, ordered a, a shot to be fired across the bow of the Grozny. As soon as that was done without McNamara's knowledge, McNamara got very upset. He ordered the firing to cease immediately. Anderson and McNamara got into a very heated verbal discussion in front of everyone. McNamara informed the Secretary of Defense that if he wasn't careful, he was going to get some of his men killed. McNamara ended the confrontation by ordering Anderson that no further shots would be fired without his explicit permission, and he stated that he would not give that order unless he got permission from the President of the United States. Finally, a crew from the USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. searched for contraband on the Grozny, found nothing, and as a result, the Grozny was allowed to proceed to Cuba. But again, there was an instance in which we could have got ourselves in trouble for nothing. That day, Cuban leader Fidel Castro was getting a little bit nervous about the United States' intentions upon his island, and so he wrote a private letter to Premier Khrushchev, and he urged Khrushchev to initiate a nuclear first strike against the United States in the event that the American invasion of Cuba occurred. And uh, as I told you yesterday, as we kind of quit, it was getting really tough for both Khrushchev and Kennedy because they really were, really were not communicating together and they were getting so much pressure from the military to take military action, it was almost becoming unbearable for them. And something had to happen that would increase the better communication between the two. And this is where the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis takes a really odd U-turn. There was a fellow by the name of John Scally, and he was an ABC's news correspondent assigned to the White House. Here's John Scally right here, again. He was an ABC News correspondent who reported on things that happened in the White House. Okay? And so he would be common for him to be at the White House interviewing the president or interviewing members of the president's cabinet or reporting each day. If you, if you get up in the news in the morning and you get into Good Morning America, they'll almost every morning have some report from outside the White House. And John Scally was an ABC News correspondent that was assigned to the White House. Well, what happened is he was contacted by a guy by the name of Alexander Fulman, although it doesn't really sound like that, or spelled like that's how it's pronounced. So Scally had been contacted by a fellow by the name of Alexander Fulman. Alexander Fulman. And by that name, what nationality do you think he might be? Russian. And what Fulman was doing, he was serving, he was actually a Soviet KGB officer in the United States, more or less a kind of a spy in a way, who was covering as a journalist in Washington, D.C. His credentials said he was a Russian journalist in the United States covering this event. But in fact, he was really a KGB officer, which was like their CIA, so to speak. So what happened is Alexander Fulman, this Soviet KGB officer who was undercover in America as a journalist in Washington, D.C., contacts ABC correspondent John Scallon, and they have a conversation. Fulman wants to wants to meet with Scally, and Fulman is the top Soviet spy in the United States. He, they don't get any higher than him, and we don't even know the guy really is in the, in the country because he's he's you know undercover as a as a journalist. So Fulman contacts Scally and sees if Scally will meet with him, and they choose to meet at a restaurant pretty close to the White House, downtown, D.C. So Scally gets this call from Alexander Fulman, who's supposedly another journalist in Russia covering this situation, but really he's a KGB agent, and he asks Scally to meet with him, and they meet at a restaurant close to the White House. 
What do you think he asked him to meet for? Anybody have any idea? He, he wants to deliver a message from Khrushchev because the militaries aren't letting these guys communicate very well, the pressure. So what, what uh, Fulman does is he asks Scali to pass a word on to President Kennedy from Premier Khrushchev. So we've got this back channel communication. Who doesn't know about this? The militaries of either country. So what Fulman has decided to do from some orders he received is try to open up these lines of communication and see if we can't get this thing settled. Because both leaders of both countries know what's going to happen if there's military action taken. They don't want that. Okay? Although they can't show weakness to their military. So Fulman asked Scali to pass a word to President Kennedy from Premier Khrushchev. And this was what Scali was to approach President Kennedy with to see if he would be favorable in these things. This is what Scali passed on, is going to pass on to the President that Fulman passed on to him from Khrushchev. And this was the deal that Khrushchev was seeing if Kennedy would agree to. First of all, number one, the Soviet Union would remove the missiles from Cuba under United Nations inspection. So who would inspect the missiles as they go out of Cuba? The United States? No, no the United Nations. That was kind of the, the deal. So the Soviet Union would agree to remove the missiles under United Nations inspection. That was the first part of the offer that Khrushchev's giving in a back channel to Kennedy that the Soviet Union would remove the missiles under United Nations inspection. Second thing is these missiles, once they were removed and inspected by the United Nations, where would they be returned back to? The Soviet Union. So that was the second part of the deal that Khrushchev was under the table proposing, that these missiles that were removed from Cuba after being inspected by the United Nations would be allowed to go back to the Soviet Union. They would keep their missiles. What was the next thing that you think might have been in there? What are we concerned about? Very good. The, the proposal was that the construction pads, the launch pads in Cuba, would be dismantled. The construction launch pads in Cuba would be dismantled. So far, so far Russia's giving up everything. They're giving up the missiles, and they're going to dismantle the construction sites, although they want their missiles back. What do you think Khrushchev wants in return from the United States? Your first thought might be the missiles in Turkey, right? But really, this offer, this initial offer, was a promise that the United States would never do what? Invade Cuba. Very good. So that was the deal that Fulman passed on to Scali, and now it was Scali's responsibility to get it to the president. One, the Soviet Union would remove the missiles under United Nations inspection. Two, the missiles that were removed from Cuba would be, be returned to the Soviet Union. Three, the construction pads in Cuba would be dismantled. And four, in return for those three things, the United States government would give their word, promise never to invade Cuba. Now, what makes me ask you this question, did the leak, was the leak promise? Did it, make, did it help out maybe? This leak. We're not sure really the extent of it because, like you guys thought, they didn't mention the missiles in Turkey. Okay? So, Scali doesn't mess around. He gets to the White House and he doesn't have an appointment, which is going to irritate who? Huh? Kenneth O'Donnell, because what's his job? The appointment secretary. So, he doesn't want the media rushing in without an appointment. So, as soon as Scali shows up, O'Donnell kind of gets after him. And so, you know, you don't have an appointment. What are you doing here? Well, I got an important word. Once Scali explained the nature of his visit to the president, he was taken right in to see the president without an appointment. But O'Donnell was doing his job, and he wasn't going to let Scali get in without an appointment. He's the appointment secretary. Once Scali told him what the deal was, they took him right in. So... Scali goes in, he fills in the president with this information that he received from Fulman, and he informs the president that he's only got three hours before he's supposed to meet with Fulman again to what? 
wrote, tell him the answer. That's right. So after filling in the president with the information he received from Foman, Scali informed the president that he had only three hours before his scheduled meeting with Foman to relay the answer. And Kennedy told Scali, I'll get back to you in a couple hours. Okay? How do we trust that, though? That's a good, thank you for bringing that, uh, that's a great point we're going to get to. Because this is what Kennedy, great job, boy. This is what Kennedy's going to do during that two hours, yeah. Can I have a shirt? You have a shirt yet? No. I'm going to give you one. Right. Yeah. Okay? That was, that was worth the shirt. Hey. So, President Kennedy said he get back to him in a couple hours. Well, probably his decision to take that deal isn't that big of a decision, right? The decision is he wants to make sure Fulman is legitimate, and indeed he knew Khrushchev, and, and Khrushchev would trust him enough to give him this message to give to him in the first place, because like Wayne said, he doesn't want to get set up here. So basically what happens is he sends who to check up on any relationship that Khrushchev may have with Fulman. Who's he send to the FBI office? Adon. So what the president does while he's thinking about this and discussing this with Bobby, basically, the president sends Kenneth O'Donnell to the FBI building to try to dig up any information, first of all, on Alexander Fulman to see if the guy even exists, and secondly, what might his relationship be with Khrushchev, because he needs to know that A, Fulman exists, and B, that Khrushchev and he know each other to a trusting point that Khrushchev would use him to pass on this message. So O'Donnell goes to the FBI building, and he gets into Fulman's file, and he really finds nothing in Fulman's file, because the FBI's got a file on everybody, just so you know. They don't find anything in Fulman's file that would tie him to Khrushchev at all. So whose file do they dig into next? Khrushchev's. And he digs into that file to try to find any connections with Fulman. So he didn't find any connections from Fulman to Khrushchev in Fulman's file. So now he's going into Khrushchev's file to see if he sees any connections between Khrushchev and Fulman in that file. And after much digging, he finds a connection. He finds a connection. What do you think the connection might have been? Think about it. Just think about what time we are in history. When might these people have served, these two guys have served together for the Soviet Union. What would have been maybe a time they'd been working together? Thank you. World War II. They were war buddies. They worked together in World War II. So the two Soviets served together in World War II and were considered war buddies. And so once O'Donnell got that information, he went back to the White House and passed that on to Kennedy. Okay? So who's opinion or recommendation is going to be crucial right now, O'Donnell's, because the president's going to listen to that, and then he's going to ask O'Donnell, what is your opinion on this relationship? Is it legit or not? Should we listen to this offer or not? You're the one down there comparing files. Do you really think these two guys have enough of a relationship we can trust it? And this was O'Donnell's response to the president. Again, you don't have to write all these down necessarily. This is what O'Donnell said to Kennedy when he said, now you really think this is legit? He said, quote, my gut's telling me that Khrushchev is turning to an old friend to carry his message. So what O'Donnell does is he assures the president that he thinks this is a legitimate friendship, that this is a legitimate trust, and he thinks that Khrushchev's offer to Kennedy is legit and true. So Kennedy mulls it over a little longer. He agrees. Scali comes back, and President Kennedy informs Scali that he would be favorable to Khrushchev's request or offer. He would be favorable to that. So Scali then is going to go from the White House back to meet with Fulman, who in turn is going to give the message back to Khrushchev. So, Khrushchev receives the news and he sends correspondence back to Kennedy stating the following two things. So Scali relays this information to Fulman, who in turn got the message back to Khrushchev. And then 
Through the fastest correspondence possible, Khrushchev responded to Kennedy saying the following two things. One, that Khrushchev had a fear of nuclear war. Khrushchev told the president he also had a fear of nuclear war. And the second thing in the correspondence is Khrushchev offered to remove the missiles and missile launching pads in Cuba if the United States would pledge they would not invade Cuba and lift what? The quarantine zone. So the response that Kennedy got back from Khrushchev was that he also had a fear of nuclear war and he also offered to remove the missiles and missile launching pads from Cuba in exchange for the United States promising never to invade Cuba and lifting that quarantine zone, which really was not an issue for Kennedy. So, the crisis is coming to an end. We've got her wrapped up. Everything's just hunky, stinking dory until 12 hours later. If we invaded Cuba today, would the Soviet Union have back up again? I think Putin would be all over it. You know, he's a hard lighter old Russian type. Good question. I think five years ago, maybe not. But I think you'd get some heat today. Yeah. Now, so like I said, the crisis looks to be done. However, 12 hours later, Khrushchev does something that's going to change the tide. So now we move to Saturday, October 27th. So we're feeling pretty good, aren't we, Fri uh, Friday night? Man, this thing is going to work out. Poof -da. Well, the next morning, considering that he just got this or other correspondence that night, Friday night, that morning of October 27th, 1962, Kennedy received another message from Khrushchev that was much different than the information he received Friday night. So the next morning, he gets another correspondence from Khrushchev. And this correspondence is much different than the one he received the day before. Yeah, we're on Saturday, October 27th. Yep. So that morning, Kennedy receives correspondence from Khrushchev, 12 hours later approximately, that is totally different. And what do you think this correspondence states? That the Soviet Union will move their, remove their missiles and missile launching pads in Cuba if the United States does what? Removes our missiles from Turkey. All of a sudden, in 12 hours, he goes from this to this. Now think about that. We'll talk about it. So, the correspondence that Kennedy received from Khrushchev just 12 hours later was that the Soviet Union would only remove the missiles and construction sites in Cuba if the United States agreed to remove their missiles in Turkey. That's my question. I mean, President Kennedy and his advisors are horrified. How in the world could the guy change his mind in 12 hours? Now, if you are XCOM, all of you, and you get this message Friday night that they're willing to trade the missiles and missile launching pads in Cuba for our pledge not to invade and to lift the quarantine zone, and the next morning, 12 hours later approximately, you get this message, what are your thoughts? What do you think? What do you think's going? What do you, what are you thinking? You're horrified because you think this thing's about over. Now we got to trade missiles in Turkey. Which do you think the military wants to trade missiles in Turkey? Are you nuts? There's no way. What are you thinking if you're the XCOM committee? What's your thought process now? What do we do? Here we go again. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, but what would be your thought process of why did the guy change his mind in 12 hours? What? That's a good guess, but not, it may be, but I, that's, not, that, that's not a bad guess. What would have to happen for him to change his mind? Who's the only one that would change his mind for him? The military. So the first thought was that there was a military coup within that 12 hours. If the military had overthrown Castro, he might even be assassinated for all they know. They might have overthrown him and killed him or thrown him in jail or sent him, you know, exiled him into, to somewhere else. So who do they think are calling the shots here? The military, okay? And Count Kennedy's just in a bind, okay? So basically, XCOM thought there was a military coup in the Soviet Union. Khrushchev had been overthrown, possibly killed. And if so, the military in Russia 
was giving the ultimatum, and this, this is a whole new scenario. Kennedy can't, he can't make that decision right now. They're not going to trade missiles in Cuba, or excuse me, missiles in Turkey for missiles in Cuba. Now, what do you think he's thinking at this point? He's all shaking his head. Then he gets some really bad news from the military surveillance. He gets bad information, or excuse me, good information that's going to require him to think about doing what now? Airstrikes and invasion. So we're going from Friday night where we think we got this thing sacked to information he received Saturday morning other than the new ultimatum by the Soviets that's going to force him to really consider airstrikes and invasion. First of all, the first news he received is that the Soviets had implemented a crash program in Cuba to get what? The missiles operational. So they now know, hey, was John McCone that far off? We lost first strike capability on this whole thing, right? So what are the Soviets doing? They're doing a crash program. They're going to get those missiles operational as soon as possible. That's the first bit of bad news Kennedy got, other than the Soviets' new ultimatum, is that the Soviets in Cuba had implemented a crash program to get the missiles operational as fast as possible. What else have they been doing during this time? Low-level flights, they continued that. And these new spy plane photos confirmed that some of the missile sites were already operational. And all other sites would be operational within 36 hours. So Kennedy gets the bad news on the new U-2 uh, flights on the deck that, hey, guess what? We've got missile sites that are already operational, and they'll all be operational.